whole field of epigenetics has taken off. And I think the development of epigenomics, the idea that you could look at the entire epigenome of a human cell, um, was very exciting. We couldn't do that before. Everything was based upon a one gene at a time type of approach. And so I didn't want to miss out on the fun, quite frankly. <laughs> My lab is uh, interested in several uh, things at the moment. Uh, firstly, we're interested in how uh, epigenetic processes interact with each other, trying to get a much more holistic view of how the different components of the nucleus work together uh, to set up stable states of uh, gene expression. You know, most of our focus up till now has been in the area of DNA methylation. Uh, but clearly, uh, DNA methylation and uh, nucleosomal remodelers and histone modifications actually talk to each other. So we're interested in how these things talk to each other. Uh, and specifically, we, what we want to know is how is this relevant to normal differentiation and how is it uh, relevant to cancer formation? So we're very much a cancer lab uh, interested in how epigenetics alters uh, the phenotype of the cell to make it a cancer cell. Now the other half of the lab is really focused on uh, epigenetic therapies. Uh, we're trying to understand at a very basic level how uh, drugs which are now used in the clinic uh, reorganize the epigenome to switch genes on uh, because we want to make better drugs in the future uh, and hopefully be able to treat patients better. So, so the frontiers in the field of uh, epigenetics and epigenomics are going to be really, I think, um, mapping whole human epigenomes. Uh, so, you know, I've played a role in the development of the International Human Epigenome Consortium, IHEC, which now has eight countries signed on, uh, which are going to, and, and we plan on mapping 1,000 uh, human epigenomes. And so I think it's going to be very, very important to do that, to get what's, uh, you know, a, a map of the ground state of different uh, cell types and to have a series of marks and maps that people can rely on. So that's a very exciting thing when, and, and that's going to be, that's starting right now. Uh, the next thing is going to be, I think, the transitioning from the field of cancer into other human diseases, particularly chronic uh, diseases such as diabetes, uh, maybe obesity, uh, mental health. These are areas in which there's a strong feeling that there may be an epigenetic basis to the disease. And then the third thing I think will be in the development of epigenetic therapies, which is my own personal love. The idea that we can actually modify epigenomes and uh, treat cancer patients in particular and um, actually have an impact on these disease states. So it's going to be a very exciting uh, uh, five or ten years. So what will the perfect epigenetic therapy look like? Well, first of all, it will have an impact. We hope it will increase the survivability of patients. Um, I think that we'll have much more uh, um, selective drugs. Uh, at the moment, most of the, at least with the DNA methylation inhibitors or PAN inhibitors, um, it's quite possible that we will develop inhibitors for you know, different DNA methyltransferase enzymes, for example. Um, I think the idea of coupling uh, uh, treatments together like using histone methyltransferase inhibitors at the same time as a DNA methylation inhibitor. Um, and, and, and finally, what's really important, I think, will be the transitioning from the therapies which now are only approved for the use in liquid tumors uh, into solid cancers. So, you know, working together with Steve Balin as part of our uh, Stand Up to Cancer Epigenetics Dream Team, we're actually really trying to bring these therapies into the treatment of solid cancers and do it much earlier. At the moment what happens, we can only treat patients after they've been through many other courses of treatment. And um, you know, I think that the, if we can get the therapy in at the beginning, because we think epigenetic um, miscues occur at the beginning of cancer, uh, I think we'll have much more uh, success in, in helping people. The advance that changed everything was next generation sequencing. Uh, the, the, the fact that one could sequence DNA um, very, very rapidly. And so that didn't become the rate-limiting step. 
And I think that coupled with uh, the development of chromatin immunoprecipitation has really allowed us to do these experiments much more rapidly than we could ever imagine in, in, in the past. So the, the next generation sequencing, CHIP-seq, has really changed everything. At the same time, from the point of view of, uh, of, of the DNA methylation analysis, the idea that one could take uh, you know, bisulfite sequencing and look at the distribution of all of the methyl groups on DNA, uh, you know, and that's been done now not only in plants but also in animals, is really a, a major breakthrough. Now what IHEC has to do is to put it all together and that's where there's still a challenge, the fact that you know you don't want one map of, uh, of DNA methylation and another map of histone modification and another map of nucleosomal distribution. You want a map that incorporates all of those into one um, in a reliable map. And so that's, that's what IHEC's going to do and of course I think the miniaturization of the procedures will be the next thing that we need because um, in order to do the project properly, you really need purified cells. And tissues are mixtures of cells. So you have to separate out the cells. And when you do that, you lose a lot of material. So I think that what we're waiting for uh, next is miniaturization of the procedures. How exactly uh, does uh, de novo DNA methylation occur? Um, I'm interested in, in DNA methylation primarily. And, and we still don't know how patterns of DNA methylation are established in embryonic stem cells, in germ cells, and in differentiated tissues. And before I quit doing epigenetics research, I'd really like to know how that works.